Hello, and welcome to another lovely session of Civil Engineering with Tanya J. Laird. I am the aforementioned Tanya J. Laird. This video is the 19th lecture in our wood design series. In this video, we'll consider the topic of beam stability, lateral torsional buckling, and the NDS's beam stability factor. Today's lovely music comes from the artist Daniel Birch from his album Ambient Volume 1. A link is included in the video description. So let's start with a review of some topics from basic mechanics. In statics and elementary mechanics courses, you learn how to calculate section properties such as moment of inertia and elastic section modulus. You learn how you can calculate the maximum bending stress in a beam by dividing the maximum bending moment by the elastic section modulus. You then design by sizing the section so the applied stress is less than the yield stress. And then you apply a factor of safety if you're using ASD or load and resistance factor design, uh, load and resistance factors if you're using LRFD. And of course, this is just uh, assuming you're using el an elastic limit state. Of, uh, if you're familiar, you can go really deep down the rabbit hole looking at plastic versus elastic design and uh, many other design considerations. But in terms of basic mechanics, these are the fundamentals. But consider for a moment how these equations are derived. These equations only work as long as certain assumptions hold. They assume a linear stress distribution, and they also assume that the beam's behavior is governed solely by elastic, strong axis bending. They assume no, no other failure modes apply. And that's fine for basic beam mechanics from, say, statics or basic uh, mechanics, but there are other ways structures and members can fail. Also in basic mechanics, you learn about columns. Columns, for example, can fail through pure axial stress, but they can also fail in Euler buckling, which is a form of member instability. When a structure or a member or an element becomes unstable, its deformations increase without limit at a fixed level of applied load. That's what happens when a column buckles. It doesn't just become more and more compressed as more axial load is applied without limit, and it doesn't just keep doing that up until the yield stress if it's too slender. Instead, it reaches a critical load where the entire column buckles sideways. Yield stress does, doesn't even appear in the equation for Euler buckling, as shown here, and it's actually elastic modulus that controls. And instead of being a function of area, it's a function of moment of inertia, which uh, is kind of interesting if you're dealing with a column. But think back to a beam. A beam has portions of its cross-section in tension and portions in compression. Every beam is essentially a column and a rope put together in order to carry a moment. You have a compressive force and a tensile force separated by a distance, and that couple is what allows you to have moment capacity. And the compression portion of that beam can buckle just like any other column can. If the beam section is not laterally stiff enough to resist this buckling, this beam will fail long before it reaches its full elastic moment capacity. We call this kind of lateral stability in beams, lateral torsional buckling. So observe this simple demonstration of lateral torsional buckling. Here I have a small, slender, cantilevered beam, a small piece of wood secured in my bench vise. I try to place a heavy iron weight on the end of it. Note I am not applying a lateral force to this beam. All I'm doing is hanging weight from it, and gravity of course points downward. Thus, only a vertical force is being applied here. I am not applying any lateral force to this beam, only vertical force. Still, notice that the beam wants to deflect not only downward, but to the side. It doesn't actually fracture or yield, rather it buckles sideways. This failure mechanism is what we refer to as lateral torsional buckling, and it prevents beams from reaching their full elastic moment capacity that is predicted by the equations of elementary mechanics. Now, this lateral stability is affected by how a beam is rotationally restrained. The cantilever is the worst case where rotational restraint is provided only on a single end. A better would be a fixed fixed case where rotational resistance is provided at both ends. And the best case would be a case of continuous bracing where rotation is prevented everywhere. If the beam can't rotate to the side, it can't fail in this manner of lateral torsional buckling. Now, what does restraints actually mean in this context? Well, restraint in this case means restraint of the compression portion of the beam. 
If we were talking about steel design, I would say we're strange with the compression flange. But since most, uh, since we often deal with simple rectangular sections, in wood design, I'll simply say the compressive portion of the beam. Remember, buckling is a compressive phenomenon, and it is ultimately the compressive portion of a beam that is buckling. Thus, to prevent lateral torsional buckling, we need to brace the part of the beam that is in compression. As such, if we have positive bending, say for example, on a simple span, or a simply supported span, then we need to brace the top portion of the beam, because that will be in compression, and the bottom of the beam if we're dealing with negative bending, like in a cantilever. Interestingly, this bracing force need not be very large. A small wooden member in firm contact with the compression portion of a beam, of a large beam, is fully capable of restraining it against lateral torsional buckling. The actual force needed to restrain um, something against lateral torsional buckling really isn't that large uh, in comparison to the overall member forces involved. It's Again, it's not really a force phenomenon, it's a stiffness and stability phenomenon. And what you need to do to prevent this is to simply provide a, uh, a degree of lateral restraint, lateral rotational restraint, of the compressive portion of your beam. So, we need a way of designing beams with lateral torsional buckling in mind. As far as how you do this, well, as you might guess, the NDS handles this through its favorite method, a stress multiplication factor. In particular, we're looking at C sub L, the NDS's beam stability factor, which is laid down in section 3.3.3. This factor adjusts the amount of allowable flexural stress on a beam depending on its support conditions. Now, unfortunately, unlike some other factors in the NDS, this is one of the more complicated ones. Determining the beam stability factor is not as simple as just looking up a value in a table. Um, similar to what you might have seen in something like steel design, determining the beam stability factor involves a small series of calculations. As such, I'm going to introduce the equations in this video and then demonstrate them in a, simple, in a second example video. The first key to calculating a beam stability factor is to determine the unbraced and effective length. The unbraced length of a beam is relatively straightforward. This is simply the distance between rotational braces of the compression portion of a beam. Uh, this bracing is usually provided at the ends of beams, but they can also be provided by other beams framing into them, a uh, floor or roof joist, or directly attached sheathing. Remember, it is the compression portion of a beam that must be restrained in order to provide lateral bracing. If you only have something joined to the tensile portion of the beam, then that does not provide uh, rotational bracing. Once a beam's unbraced length is determined, the next step is to determine its effective length. Again, unbraced length and effective length are two related but different things. Uh, this can be derived from theory, looked up in a reference, or found in NDS Table 3.3.3. Shown here is this table in the NDS. Note that the unbraced length depends on the type of beam, whether that, whether that is simple span, a cantilever, etc., the location of lateral bracing, and the type of loading. Also, keep in mind that in terms of strength, a shorter effective length is better, the best case being a continuously braced beam, where the effective length would basically be zero. Now, with that, on, with that on, in mind, at first table 3.3.3 seems a bit odd. Notice that as the number of brace points increases, the factor actually increases in some cases. The factor to go from unbraced effective length uh, is 1.1.1 for a single midspan load and bracing, while it's 1.84 if there are seven load and brace points. Wouldn't that mean a longer effective length? Well, the key to keep in mind is that these factors are applied or are multiplied to the unbraced length, not the overall length. More frequent bracing will lower the overall effective length but the precise, the precise factors in this table consider both the basic mechanics and some amount of redundancy and factors of safety. So you're not multiplying across the entire length of the beam. As your number of brace points increases, your unbraced length is also decreasing. So these two, th these two um, terms tend to work together. Now, as a whole, the more braces you have, um, the, the smaller the effective length, um, but there is some slight deviation from that due to uh, considerations of redundancy and safety involved. Next, once you have the effective length determined, there are a series of interstitial calculations you make to determine the beam stability factor. 
you first calculate the, the slenderness ratio by equation 3.3-5 and make sure it doesn't exceed 50. If it does, you need to redesign your member, select a different section. Uh, next, you calculate two stress parameters, FBE and FB star, which are calculated as shown. Finally, you calculate the beam stability factor from equation 3.3.6, and again, we will look at some examples of this in the next video. Alright, that will do it for now. Our next video will be a series of examples of calculating the beam stability factor, which will be released shortly after this one. This video is just meant to be a short discussion of the need for the beam stability factor, what lateral torsional buckling is, its relation to uh, column buckling, and basic mechanics. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments below. If you found this video interesting or useful, please like, comment, and subscribe to make the robots happy. If you want to help make content like this possible, see the link to our Patreon page in the video description. I would like to thank our existing patrons, uh, Stefan, Edmund, and Logan. Thank you for all your support. Regardless, we'll be back soon with another video in the series. I look forward to seeing you all then, and as always, thank you.